The one that absolutely thrilled me was from Walter Brueggemann, uh, who's a major theologian at Columbia Theological Seminary. And this is, these are all just t uh, sentences from there. He calls it this intergenerational collusion of father and daughter. I just love that statement. Makes available for us a testimony of faith that is light-knowing, hope-filled, and honest. Mm. And uh, uh, Harry Anderson, who was a bishop here in this area, a few years ago. Uh, he actually grew up in Kronenberg, Nebraska, that last church that I showed you. And he, uh, he was, uh, he's just been wonderful. He says, I am mightily moved and impacted by the thoughtful sermons and the stories that follow. And then uh, Deanne Lingerquist is not a person that I know, but she's a friend of a friend of mine uh, who, who is the head of, uh, the head of, the Forward is written by Mark Mattis, who teaches religion and theology at Grandview University, and he's written the forward. And I said, you know, I'd really like to have, I'd really like to have a woman theologian write about this. You know, and so it was important to me, and so he suggested her, and I was just uh, thrilled that she would take the time over her Easter vacation to read this book, to come back to read this book, and to write a really beautiful statement about it. And in part, she says, reconstructing her father's sermons and imagining uh, parishioners' responses, Joy Ibsen opens a window into worshippers' lives through the cycle of the church year and in several decades. I think it's a very nice description of the book. She's from St. Olaf College. Well, my last slide that is basically a scene from that first place at Diamond Lake, and it's the, the lane that led from the parsonage to the church. And uh, it's actually where my infant baby brother was, was uh, buried. But what I wanted to really say about that was to show that slide, because it's just a beautiful little picture, and say, unafraid, where I hope that you will always be unafraid wherever you go. Choose God to, choosing God to guide you. Let your course run high or low. He will strength provide you. Give your life for what you love until death be loyal. God will bless you from above. Living will be royal. Yeah. Yeah. Sermon comes from uh, uh, it's about fishermen. Do we have some fishermen in the eyes or fishermen? Uh, and uh, it's time that uh, Jesus says to let down your nets again. Okay, it says we have toiled all, all night and taken nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the nets. And so this is when Jesus, says, you gotta let your nets down again. Try again because they tried and they hadn't caught any fish and they're getting all really upset. So certain occupations, especially those that are close to nature, are bound by traditions. Superstitions are not easily cast aside. Fisherman is one such vocation. And he goes on to talk about, to be a good fisherman, some say you need to be born into it. It has to be in your bloodstream. A good fisherman seems to have a sixth sense for judging the exact direction and velocity of the wind. He goes on, fishermen in this congregation must know how difficult it was for Simon Peter that morning to say, Nevertheless, nevertheless, I'll let down my nets. We have toiled all night and taken nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the nets. In order to fully appreciate Simon Peter's response to Jesus, we must know something about his skill and experience as a fisherman. Simon Peter was a fisherman as his father had been before him. When Simon Peter climbed into his boat to go fishing, he looked to wind and weather, sign and seas and skies, sea and instinct to determine his course of action. Simon Peter knew that even if he obeyed all the rules, he sometimes caught fish and sometimes nothing but seaweed. Life is a great deal like that. But rules are rules and a person must follow them to be successful. Simon Peter's father believed and practiced fishing in shallow waters. Why should Jesus, who was not a fisherman, introduce a new way of fishing? There may have been times when Simon Peter wondered whether the deeper water held some good large fish. Perhaps there were times when old Jonas wondered the same. But as everybody knew and had always known, successful fishing was restricted to the shallows. Simon Peter kept to the shallow water. Simon Peter was tired and in a bad mood. 
It's always more tiresome to work when you're getting nowhere than when you're making progress. Simon Peter was not any worse off than the rest of the fishermen. His was not the only empty boat, and perhaps he found consolation in realizing that. Most people do. When people discover they are getting nowhere in the business of living, it is easy to glance at their neighbors and say, Oh well, I'm no worse off than they are. This may be true, but it does not solve the problem of a dissatisfied soul. The text says the fishermen were washing their nets. From this we know the fishermen had been raking their nets through the weeds in the muck of shallow water. Is that the same trouble many of us have? We never really get away from the shallowness of our lives where we rake our nets in muck. We stay too close to the shore. The deep things of the spirit are usually left unexplored while we grab for the things that moth and rust destroy. We think of life in terms of our appetites, rarely in terms of our spiritual aspirations. Simon Peter was entirely respectful, but it's easy to see he didn't take a lot of stock in the deep water idea. I suppose we can imagine what he thought. If we who have grown up on this lake and learned to fish when we were little boys, who know the habits of the fish like the back of our hands, where they are likely to be found at given times and wonder what weather conditions, if we have nothing to show for a whole night's work, can a carpenter who has never caught a fish in his life give us good advice? Nevertheless, said Simon Peter, if you say so, we will put the nets down deeper. It was this nevertheless that made a great man out of Simon Peter, nevertheless carries with it the mark of high adventure. Embedded in this word is the faith that overcomes the word world. At thy word we will lower the nets. Simon Peter learned to take Jesus at his word. He learned that his word would lead into deep water, but in his word was eternal life. If only we could learn to say, ah, the word, O Lord, even when trusting in God seems unreasonable, when we cannot understand why, when it does not seem promising to go out into the deep water which can be filled with great difficulties, because that is often the case. Uh, trust in God, thou hast promised to Lord always, there out in the deep. And that's basically most, almost all the sermon. And then it's followed by a story about some fishermen, a couple of fishermen out there fishing. I won't read a lot of it, but it's Hans and Peter out there fishing. And it talks about Hans is a very sort of spiritual spiritually minded one. Peter is not so much. He, he just wants to not think about it too much. So Hans had his own trinity. Farming, family, and fishing. To farm was to be on intimate terms with the creator God, the Father. From flowers growing in the grassy springtime to furious hailstorms pelting crops, the creator God was always present, if only on the horizon. Hans did not find it so difficult to believe in God could, that God could be human. It was only a matter of degree. Degree. Reading a story to Eric, his grandson, was a little like knowing God the Son. Having coffee in the afternoon with Sovi, his wife, was to experience a whiff of the divine in a human being. And the Holy Spirit? It was in fishing Hans found the presence of the Holy Spirit. Fishing was communion with earth and water. It was experiencing the fresh, joyous wiggliness of life. Hans especially liked to fish with Peter. And so it goes on, and uh, Hans is one of these people who just, uh, uh, to use a phrase I just learned, overthinks. I was accused of overthinking. <laughs> Basically, it had to do with computers. Just don't overthink. <laughs> so, and Hans is another person who overthinks. Uh, so I say, on this Monday morning's fishing expedition, Hans was thinking of the minister's sermon about fishing. Was Simon Peter a good fisherman? How much had Jesus fished? There was so much about Jesus that wasn't in the Bible. Does Jesus know what it was like to get a pole in his line? To unhook the fish from its bait? Had he ever cleaned fish, chopped off their heads? Did Jesus know when and where the fish were going to bite? Hence doubted that was the case because it would take all the fun out of it. Hence certainly knew why the disciples went fishing after the crucifixion. They needed to get away from all that trouble, all that commotion <laughs> in Jerusalem. Fishing was exactly what they needed to get out of town and hightail it to Galilee. That is what Simon Peter had done. Hans understood exactly how the disciples must have felt. Simon Peter fished with nets, something Hans had never tried. Simon Peter had stepped out of the boat and walked on water before he lost his nerve and sank. Well, that's the way it goes when you have doubts. What was it like to fish out there in the Sea of Galilee, which Reverend Ibsen said was really a lake, 
And to have Jesus, who had died just a short while ago, show up with the shore and cook fish. What kind of fish? Perch? Perhaps it was fresh perch. Hans would have loved eating supper with Jesus and the disciples. Peter would have liked it too. Hans could imagine the glow of the hot embers, the smell of fish cooking over the fire on the beach. Now almost 2,000 years later, sitting on the Vermilion River Bank on the other side of the world, Hans, a farmer more than a fisherman, could almost touch it, almost be there. What Hans liked about Jesus was he did practical things, like cooking fish for his friends instead of telling a person what to do and what not to do. He cooked and ate with you. Even after he had been killed, he still came back and ate with you. Oh,